some wonderful work in that domain. And uh, this time, he's going to be telling us about uh, his recent work on sample-efficient reinforcement learning on under-complete phone DPs. So with that, uh, Jinghua, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. And thank you for having me here. OK, so today I will talk about sample-efficient reinforcement learning of under-complete phone DPs. Um, this is a joint work with my advisor, Chi Jing and my collaborators, um, Sham Kakid and Akshay Krishan Murdy. Um, I will first uh, talk about some background knowledge about learning prime DPs. Um, what's the definition? And what are the challenges of learning prime DPs compared to learning MDPs? And what have the previous uh, works done in this topic? And then I will introduce the settings we are going to work with in this talk. And we will make some, um, some um, mild assumptions. And I will also provide some lower bounds to justify our assumptions. OK, so oops. And after that, uh, I will mainly focus uh, on the algorithm design part. Uh, specifically, uh, we will introduce the observable operator models. And we will utilize this uh, observable operator models to design an algorithm um, called OMUCD. Uh, which can efficiently efficiently learn a large class of prime DPs using only po polynomial samples. And I will also walk you through a proof sketch of our main result. OK, um, let's start. Mm. Well, well, can I see? OK, so in many reinforcement learning applications, uh, there is a very challenging feature called partial observability. So it basically means uh, the agent cannot observe the full environment and only have access to some partial information. Um, for example, uh, in poker games, uh, the player can only see his own cards and possibly the common cards on the desk. He doesn't know what his opponents have in hands. And in robotics, uh, usually a robot can only detect objects in front of its cameras or sensors. And this feature is also very common in video games. Um, like in StarCraft, a player can only observe what is happening around its units or troops. And in hide and seek, um, each agent only has a limited view of the entire game space. Um, Prime DP is a classic model um, for modeling such partial observability feature. Um, different from MDPs, uh, in Prime DPs, uh, the agent cannot directly observes the hidden state. Uh, instead, it only receives an observation imitated by the uh, hidden state. Uh, in other words, if you are familiar with the definition of hidden Markov model, uh, you may think of prime DP as a hidden Markov model uh, with input control. So um, due to this partial observability uh, feature, Learning prime DPs is actually much more challenging than learning MDPs. Um, why? Uh, I gave two concrete reasons here. Um, first, in prime DPs, uh, we cannot observe the current state. So we cannot even determine if a new state has been reached by our agent. So this poses a great challenge for doing exploration um, because most of the existing techniques uh, we know uh, requires maintaining some counters um, to record how, how often we have reached some state or some feature direction. And the second um, difficulty is uh, in prime DPs, uh, the current hidden state can depend on the entire history. So um, this means the optimal um, policy should also um, pick actions based on the entire observation history. Um, as a result, um, in order to compute the optimum policy, uh, we need to search over a policy space of dimension exponential in the horizon lens. So this is a great challenge for both computation and, uh, and sample efficiency. So given these um, difficulties, uh, it's not so surprising to see there are actually many harness results for learning prime DPs. And specifically, um, for planning, it has been shown that uh, even when the parameters are known, um, that is, even when the model is given, 
uh, computing the optimum policy is still on um, PC based complete. And even if we only want to compute the optimal memoryless policy, it's still NT hard. So basically, uh, it seems like QuantumDP is a really challenging topic to work with. So the question uh, we want to ask here is, can we obtain any positive result for learning point DPs? And the answer is yes, because all these uh, harness results are in the computational sense. Um, they don't exclude the possibility of sample efficient learning. And in the following talk, uh, I will show you uh, we can design an algorithm that can efficiently learn a rich class of prime DPs using only polynomial samples. And uh, before introducing our work, I want to quickly uh, go through some existing results uh, in this topic. Um, most of the earlier works in, uh, for prime DPs uh, don't provide any finite sample capacity guarantee. So we will not talk about them here. Um, some recent works, uh, actually not, not so recent, it's like five years ago, um, they provide some finite sample capacity guarantees for learning prime DPs. However, um, some of them assume um, all the latent states can be reached by just taking random actions. And some of them assume um, the learner is given a class of policies and by following an arbitrary policy in that policy class, basically the agent can explore um, the entire environment. So in summary, um, the main limitations of these works is that uh, they don't address the exploration challenge in prime DPs. Um, or in other words, um, they, they make some strong assumptions to avoid the difficulty of exploration. And in this work, uh, we will directly attack this exploration challenge uh, without making similar strong assumptions. Um, now let me introduce the formal settings. Um, so, Formally, in a prime DP, uh, we have a state site, um, an observation site, and an action site. Um, and in this talk, we will consider um, the finite horizon setting. And we denote the length of horizon by capital H. And similar to MDPs, uh, we have a transition measure on specifying the probability of transitioning to S prime after taking action A and state S and step H. Um, different from MDPs, we have an additional emission measure specifying the distribution of observations conditioning on the current hidden state being S. Um, we will assume the initial hidden state S1 is sampled from some unknown distribution mu1. And in this talk, uh, we will assume the reward function is given and it maps a sequence of observations and actions to a scalar between zero and capital H. Okay. Uh, um, now let me um, introduce the formal assumption. So in, we make the following two assumptions. Uh, first, uh, we assume the prime DP is under complete. Um, that is uh, the state space is no larger than the observation space. And second, uh, we assume um, the minimum singular value uh, of the observation matrices is lower bounded away from zero. So you can view these two assumptions as a robust version of assuming the emission matrix have rank S. So the intuitive reason for uh, assuming uh, the emission matrix to have rank S is that if several different hidden states have linearly dependent emission distribution, then we may be unable to distinguish between them and may encounter some uh, statistical harness results. And uh, so to justify these two assumptions, uh, we provide the following lower bound. Um, showing that uh, with absence of either assumption A or assumption B, learning a prime DP requires at least exponential samples uh, in general. 
Yeah. Uh, is there any question uh, in the chat? I, I see a lot of messages, but I'm not sure. Oh, that's a, that's a largely irrelevant discussion regarding the the input size and how do you specify polynomial? Like, do you talk about like the bits necessary for explaining the transition probabilities, or just the number of states and actions? Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe we can tell them after. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, this is something to save for later. Yeah. Thanks. Otherwise, it's all clear. Yes. Okay. Let's move on. Um, so. Uh, in the remainder of this talk, uh, we will mostly focus uh, on the algorithm design part. And specifically, we will utilize these classic observable operator models uh, to design and sample efficient algorithm. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So, so can you still just go back to these lower bands? Uh, mm -hmm. Because sure. I guess, uh, so are you going to explain like the construction that leads to these lower bands? Or is it like too obvious? Or, oh yeah, actually, what can you say about it? Yeah, I think uh, yeah. So the intuition, yeah, actually, this the construction is based on the combinatorial lock model. So basically, uh, we will const we will construct the observation measure so that uh, we cannot distinguish between different states uh, in the combinatorial lock, and then learning that prime DP is equivalent to doing random exploration in combinatorial lock. So I have that uh, I have that construction in uh, in the end of this talk. Uh, yeah, we can talk about them in details then. I see. So that's I suppose an example in which you have to like execute a long sequence of actions, and only at the end you get to observe. What yeah, yeah, happening. right. Yeah, all the observations in the first h in the first h minus one steps are like garbage observation. They don't give you mm -hmm. useful information. Right. I see. And and is planning also hard in this problem or? Uh, oh yeah, I think yeah, I think once you, but I think in, in that construction, once you know the model planning is, you know, is no longer hard because it's oh like, yeah, right, right, because it's just a particular sequence of actions that you have to execute. Yeah, right. and that is, I think that's, when we talk about hardness about planning before, a lot of them is like computational hardness. Not this is like talking about statistical hardness, right. so it's a little, a little bit different. Right, yeah, yeah. I, I got that part that you don't care about computation, or at least not so far. But uh, but I guess you can, yeah, okay. it's better if you could just continue and then, uh, and then yeah. just get into all these distinctions higher. Uh, OK, so now let's look at the formal definition of observable operator models. So in an observable operator model, um, the probability of any observation sequence can be written as the product of operators. So by some elementary um, calculation, we can verify um, prime DPs also belong to the observable operator model family. And there exists um, a set of operators, um, capital B and B and small b, um, parameterized by the parameters of this prime DP, um, such that um, the probability of any observation sequence um, conditioning on an, an arbitrary action sequence can be written as the product of a sequence of operators. So um, please don't worry about this uh, involved definition here. So in order to follow this talk, you only need to, uh, you only need to know um, there exist such operators uh, so that we can utilize them to compute the probability of any observation sequence. Uh, is there uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, initialization uh, applied to this, or uh, kind of a bootstrap? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm not sure, but uh, sorry, I, I I'm not sure. No, the, 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 this is independent of initialization or bootstrap or whatever. This is just uh, talking about uh, how we're going to represent this uh, conditional probability distribution. By, by this mass formula, by product of the matrix. OK. Good, thanks. Oh, OK. Um, so uh, what are the benefits of adopting this operator view? So basically, uh, we have three benefits. Um, so first, uh, we if we adopt this operator view, we no longer need to recover the model parameters um, because learning operators 
are already sufficient to determine the dynamics of this prime DP. And second, um, these operators are indexed um, by the observations and actions. Um, they are not indexed by the unobservable or underlying hidden states. So intuitively, they should be uh, easier to work with. And finally, but most importantly, um, these operators, um, they satisfy certain moment constraints. And we can utilize these moment constraints um, to estimate um, these operators. So, uh, sorry, just mm -hmm. a second. So, so you just called these operators matrices before. So, are these linear operators then? Uh, so these all oh, these operators are not. Yeah, they, they are some. Uh, they are not some. They may not be some linear function of the parameters of the prime DP model. But yeah, when we utilize them, we will multiply them together. So, what we obtain seems yeah, it's not it's it's not a linear function of the operator. I see. Uh, I guess uh, I think what what Xinhua means is a uh, it's not a linear function of the uh, emission matrix and the transition matrix, but uh, but on answer Gregory's question, it is a you can view it as a linear operator. Like when you apply it to some vector, it gives you a flat vector. It is a matrix. You can think it's a matrix. Yes. I see. I see. So basically, it's not a linear function of the parameters, but nevertheless, the operators themselves are linear. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the linear is something. You can take their product in the usual sense as, as you take a matrix product and, yeah, that's, and yeah. you apply it to vectors in the usual uh, matrix vector product sense. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so now let's look at this uh, moment constraint. So let's consider the following uh, problem setting. So given two arbitrary actions, A and A tilde, and a policy pi. So suppose we roll in with policy pi. So we execute policy pi uh, from step one to step h minus two. And this will produce a distribution over the hidden state at step h minus one. And then we, we take action a tilde at step h minus one and action a at step h, uh, regardless of our observation histories. And this will, uh, so by doing this, uh, this will produce a distribution over the observations from step h minus one to step h plus one. And then we define the following two probability matrices. So we define this matrix N to be the uh, joint probability matrix of OH and OH minus one. And we define this uh, matrix M um, to be a slice of the three-dimensional probability tensor uh, in the OH direction. So these two probability matrices are all O by O. And then we can, so by directly plugging in the definition of B, uh, we, we, we can verify um, the operators will satisfy this uh, linear moment constraint. So this this moment constraint holds for uh, all choices of a, a, a tilde, O, and small h. So this will be the k equation we will to, to use in our algorithm. And moreover, um, if this matrix N have rank S, uh, that is the cardinality of the state space, and then we can show um, this operator um, can be uniquely identified um, by this moment constraint. And now with this uh, moment constraint, uh, we are ready to design our algorithm. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, this, uh, yeah, this moment const constraint holds uh, no matter what's your history before step H minus one. Right, so when you say that this takes as input a policy, that can be like any policy or any non-stationary yeah, policy. Yeah, this policy pie can be arbitrary. It can be history dependent. Yeah. Right. Random. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now let's look at the algorithm. So the high-level idea of this algorithm is actually uh, very simple. So. In this algorithm, uh, we will maintain 
on a confidence side, uh, which contains some prime DP model ca candidates. So we denote this kind uh, this confidence side by capital theta k. And uh, in each iteration, uh, first we do optimistic planning. Uh, specifically, uh, we enumerate all the prime DP models in this confidence set, and we compute its optimal um, policy. And then we pick the prime DP model that can give us the largest possible reward, and we output its, its optimal policy, pi k. So basically, we are, we are picking the most optimistic model in this confidence set. And then we collect data uh, using this policy pi k. Uh, and after that, we will utilize the collect data uh, to construct our confidence side uh, capital theta k. So I will talk about more details uh, about these two steps uh, in the following slides. So the core idea of this uh, algorithm is local confidence side uh, plus global optimism. So by global optimism, uh, so why, the reason for calling it global optimism is because uh, we are picking the most optimistic model in the entire confidence set. And the reason for calling it local confidence set is because in the third step, when we construct the confidence set, uh, we will first construct many local confidence sets. And each confidence set only look at three consecutive steps in a whole trajectory. And then we will take the intersection of all the local confidence sets, and this will give us um, this the final confidence set theta k. Okay, now let's look at the second step uh, uh, in details. So here we are basically doing the same thing as we did in the moment constraint section. So first we execute the policy pi k um, from step. Um, one to step h minus two. Um, and then we take action A tilde as step h minus one, and step and action A as step h, regardless of our observations, uh, anything else. So this will give us a data triple uh, sampled from the joint distribution of OH minus one, OH, and OH plus one. And then we can uh, update our counters n height and m height using this um, data triple. So here you can view this n height and m height as some empirical estimate of the matrix n and the matrix m we used before. So uh, after obtaining this data, uh, we can construct uh, our confidence site. So first, uh, we will replace um, the previous um, probability matrices n and m um, by their empirical estimate, n height and m height. And then we want to utilize the moment constraint. But because our, these estimates uh, may not be accurate, so we need to relax the equation to some inequalities. So this gamma uh, is a noise tolerance parameter. And we can determine it uh, using standard concentration arguments. So, uh, so here actually uh, we are we are constructing this confidence set for all possible choices of O, A, A tilde, and H. So we have a lot of local confidence sets. And finally, we will take the intersection of all the local confidence sets, and and additionally we implicitly enforce our assumption into the definition of confidence set. And this will give us the final definition of the, of the theta k. So this is uh, how we construct the confidence set. And this is basically everything about our algorithm. Mm, OK, so I, I have a couple of questions here. So in the definition of the confidence set, like what norm are you using? Is that like a weighted norm or just a two norm? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, it can be. Yeah, it can be Frobenius norm or it can be L two norm. Yeah, because our final our final sample capacity will be some polynomial results, so it it will only incur some 
yeah, like one additional uh, S or O dependence, yeah. Because our I see. but uh, but I guess essentially you can afford to use this norm because your algorithm is a forced exploration algorithm, right? That you're just sweeping over all H, all A, all A tilde, so that you make sure that you have equal se sample sizes for all of these combinations, right? And this is why you can have like equally wide confidence into all, over all of these parameters. Uh, Do I get this right? Uh, because because if you would have like different sample sizes for well, for I the think different the combinations, actually depends on the count. Uh, does it depend on count? I... Yeah, I think it depends on so so here gamma depends on the how many iterations we have done. So it is it's like square root capital K. Exactly how many iterations we have done so far. Right, but this is the total number of iterations and not and not the sample size for this particular combination of O A A tilde. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, because we are doing equal number of iterations for right. For yes, 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 exactly, exactly. So there is no difference. Yeah, yeah. So so I guess like I sort of missed like the like the goal of this uh, of this whole study. Are you trying to minimize regret or just come up with a sample efficient way of producing a near optimal policy? Oh, we don't have regret results here because. Uh, right, you uh, just waste too much time exploring in this side, right? Yeah, now. it's like we, we iterate over all the possible choices of A and A to them. So we don't have regret guarantee. But we can, but yeah, what we have is some sample capacity guarantee for finding optimal policies. Right, yes. Okay, gotcha. Very good. Also, one more thing to mention um, this algorithm is definitely not computationally efficient. Yeah, because uh, like the first step, we need to enumerate all, all the possible models. And even if we, we only have one model, um, the planning part will be like NP hard. Yes, right. I realized this when, you, when you're explaining that, that slide that you're only going to talk about like number two yeah. and three. Yeah, you just yeah. mentioned number one, yeah. which is hard. Yes. Okay, so uh, under the previous assumptions we, we introduced, uh, we can show uh, this algorithm can find a nearly optimal policy using only polynomial samples uh, with some constant probability. So, so despite all the challenges and difficulties I mentioned at the beginning, we eventually still find some statistically efficient algorithm for this exploration setting. And uh, to our knowledge, this is the first polynomial sample capacity result um, in the exploration setting for prime MVPs. And I want to, uh, yeah, I want to make some minor comments here. So, so here is the dependence on the error term epsilon. Uh, so it's optimal because even in the bandit setting, uh, one our epsilon square is already optimal. And we can also um, boost this success probability to arbitrarily close to one. Uh, which will only incur an additional logarithmic term. And finally, I want to see um, the dependence on the cardinality of state space, action space, and observation space uh, is, is not optimal here. It's, we have some polynomial of degree 9 or 10, so there, there is nothing that can be done here. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to uh, walk you through a brief proof sketch uh, of this theorem. Um, so first, um, by using some standard Martingale concentration, uh, we can show uh, the true operators um, uh, satisfy the moment constraints uh, we constructed with high probability. So therefore, the true operator, the true prime DP model. Uh, should also lie in this competence set uh, with high probability. And second, uh, recall uh, we are doing optimistic planning uh, in the in the algorithm. So the so the optimal value function of the optimistic of the optimistic model should be an upper bound of the true value function, uh, true optimal value function of the of the model. So we can upper bound this uh, suboptimality gap um, by this difference. So the 
the most important of so here uh, v pi k theta k so it's the optimal value function of the prime dp model parameterized by theta k and v pi k theta star uh, is the value function of executing policy pi k in the prime, t, prime dp model um, parameterized by theta star so theta star is the true parameters of our prime dp model we want to estimate so we work with so notice here that um, the policies are the same they are both they both have pi k the only difference is the model part so one model is theta c uh, is theta k and another model is theta star so this is like some model difference instead of policy difference and so by some further computation uh, we can find this model difference term by the operator difference so this operator is the uh, operators of on theta k and this operator is the uh, is parameterized by theta star. So the most important thing here is the operator difference is related by the probability of visiting this hidden state S. And, and this direction here is also um, associate, associated with this um, hidden state S. So that is uh, we know we don't need to recover these operators in order to bound the duality gap. Uh, we only need to make sure the operators are accurate in those directions uh, associated with the frequently visited hidden states. So this is a key intuition here. And by some further computation, uh, we can show um, this the right hand side of this of this equation is at most a uh, square root capital K, uh, yeah, multiplied by some other polynomial factors. Uh, if we construct the confidence site uh, as we did in the OM UCB algorithms. Yeah, that's basically, yeah, the key part of our proof. Uh, okay, yeah, it goes, a little bit faster than I anticipated. Okay, so finally, um, I want to point out some future directions to further explore in this topic. So first, uh, in this work, we consider uh, over complete, uh, we consider under complete prime DPs. Uh, so what can we say about over complete prime DPs? That is, um, the observation space uh, may be much smaller than the late hidden latent space. In that case, I, I guess we may need some slightly stronger assumptions. And second, uh, it's also interesting um, to consider the macro game setting with partial observation, because a lot of practical applications fall, in the, fall into this setting. For example, the poker games, um, the video games with multi, multi players. And we can also yeah, think about how to do function approximation. Uh, um, for prime DPs. And in that case, uh, we will hope to get some sample capacity scaling with the uh, ambient dimension of uh, scaling with the complexity of the function class, and not the cardinality of the state space or the observation space. And finally, um, we can also think about if we can find um, some stronger assumption, uh, yeah, stronger but practical assumptions so that we can also have computational efficiency. Yeah, that's all something to hope for. Yeah, I think that's it for the prime DP part. Yeah, so I want to, yeah, is there any questions? Uh, so I guess I, I'm still trying to place or like put together your lower bound with the upper bound. So your lower bound is exponential in age. Whereas your upper bound was polynomial in H. So like what, what did I miss? Was there a mismatch between the assumptions or something? Uh, okay, so in the lower bound, uh, so our observation matrix does so the intuition is in our lower bound, uh, our observation matrix can be some degenerate one. So, oh, so it, it cannot 
give in, give us enough information about the latent hidden state. But in the in, when proving the upper bound, we, we assume the emission matrix have four rank. So some in some sense, it gives us the observation provides enough information for us to only identify the latent structure. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Now I understand. Okay, sorry, sorry. I missed this the first time around. So then, but does, that does not generally mean that just because your observation matrix is singular, you're always going to have a hard problem. Right? You oh, may okay. still be able to like extract enough information to to calculate the optimal policy. Yeah, in that case, we yeah we may get some ambiguity issue. Yeah, if it's we generate. Yeah, yeah. Actually, if you are interested, we can take a look at the proof sketch or lower bound. It's actually very simple. Yes. 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 That sounds good. Yeah. I think yeah, a lot of you um, are confused about this. So, so the construction is very simple. So, it's based on the combinatorial log model. So, uh, so in case some of the audience are not familiar with this model, let me briefly introduce the definition here. And so the combinatorial log model is an MDP model. Uh, in this MDP, uh, we have two states, uh, a good state uh, in red circle and a bad state uh, in black one. Um, we have two actions, A1 and A2. Um, there is no reward in the first H minus one steps. And in the last step, if, we, if the agent is at the good state, it will receive reward one and otherwise, it will re receive reward zero. And for each step, there is an optimal action. If the agent takes the optimal action at the good state, it will stay at the good state. Otherwise, it will always transit to the bad state. So the optimal policy for this model is to execute the sequence of optimal actions. So the key observation about this model is if in this model, the agent cannot observe uh, which state it is, it is at and, th and only receive the final reward information, then this, this model is basically equivalent to a multi-arm bandits with exponentially many arms. And following this uh, observation, uh, we can construct our uh, our hard prime DP examples. So in this hard prime DP examples, uh, we have four different states. Um, G1, uh, G, uh, two gold states, G1 and G2, and two bad states, B1 and B2. We have two different observations, um, sum and star. Um, in the first H minus one steps, we always observe sum at G1, B1, and we always observe star at G2 and B2. And there is no reward in the first H minus one steps. And in the final step, we always observe sum at good states and always observe star at bad states. And if we observe sum, we will receive reward one. And uh, now let, let, let me introduce the transition dynamics. So the transition dynamics is also very similar to, to the combinatorial log. So we assume the initial hidden state is sampled uniformly at random from these four states. And for each step, there is an optimal action. If we take the optimal action at good states, we will transit to one of the good states uniformly at random. Otherwise, we will transit to the bad states uniformly at random. So in this example, uh, in order to, uh, so the optimal policy is to follow the optimal actions at each step. So if we make one mistake, we will miss the final reward. So the key observation about this example is that in some sense, we cannot distinguish between G1 and B1, uh, G2 and B2 in the first H minus one steps. So the observations in the first H minus one steps gives us no useful information for identifying the optimal action. And the only useful information is the observation in the last step. So this, so this is basically equivalent to the 
combining parallel model without being able to see the current state. So we can also easily verify on this in this example, uh, we have yeah we have fewer uh, observations than hidden latent states, and but the observation matrix actually has lower bounded minimum singular value. So it validates the first assumption. It's not anti-complete. Uh, it satisfies the second assumption. So similarly, uh, we can construct some example showing that the second assumption is also necessary in some sense. Yeah, that's, the, that's basically what we are doing here. Right, I see. And, and, and for the upper bounds, your condition on the smallest eigenvalue um, what that in, that in each stage you have a separate observation matrix and for all of these the smallest eigenvalue is lower bounded oh uh, yeah right uh yeah in our proof we require that right so so i suppose i suppose that requires like already your initial distribution to have like good enough support right oh no we don't need that so actually this is the key point of this work so if we assume mm -hmm initial hidden state can cover the entire hidden state space, and then we don't need to explore anymore. So right. in, in our work, we, we don't make any assumptions about the initial distribution, about the transition. So there can be some states we can never reach. Yeah. Right, um, but, but it, this is still some sort of a coverage assumption. Maybe it's not as strict as, as some others, but it definitely requires some richness already of the initial distribution. Uh, I don't think we need that. So there can be some hidden state. You can reach. You can only reach it with exponentially small probability. But, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we we can still get this result here. So yeah, so, I, I think this is not a assumption about the richness. Like like a, for our case, we can also allow like some states to. Re reachable only after each steps or something like we, we don't have anything about reachability i think this is something about uh, about uh, identifiability uh, like as Ch chaba said in a in a ch in the chat basically like how you gonna able to tell because you only can infer the lat latent states you are never sh make sure like which state it is so it's how mm -hmm. you're gonna able to tell if you have a lot of observations like then which state it might be in so assumption B is small. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah, I think, yeah, I want to, yeah, I think it also, I mean, it's also consistent with our intuition here because uh, we can never visit, yeah, we can visit some hidden state with very small probability and our operators can be uh, extremely accurate in, in those directions. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, uh, Chama. Yeah. So I had uh, some questions, uh, a bunch of them. Uh, but to start with, is the minimum single value needed to be known for the ergotum? Uh, yeah, I think it's needed. Uh, one reason. Is, so, uh, one reason is we need it in the proof, and the second reason is, if you if we go back to the definition of operators, uh, yeah. yeah, we can see this. Um, but this definition actually utilizes the left pseudo inverse of this observation matrix. So if it's if it's I mean if it's minimal single value is arbitrarily close to one, on this this matrix can be I mean can have very large norm. So yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I think Chaba yeah. is asking whether our algorithm requires the knowing the minimal single value. I think That's the right. answer is also yes. Like we have one hyperparameter. Yeah, we need set to require the minimal making value. Right, right. And did, did you think about uh, how to remove that assumption, whether that's possible to remove, to adapt to the minimum singular value? Um, One feels that it's like, OK, like there are these linear systems, and it's a stability question. Uh, but you could empirically maybe you know get some estimate of the minimum singular value and then get some lower bond. And if you don't, if your lower bond is still zero, then you can't say anything, but eventually it starts to be non-zero and then maybe things are gonna work well. Uh, you, I assume you need the minimum singular value in a confidence at construction. Oh, I think- Go ahead, sorry. 
Oh, so I think one simple math, so one simple method would be, yeah, we can just do some, I mean, land search uh, for this alpha. Yeah, we can try different alpha value and see which one works better. Yeah, that's what, yeah, because- you, you have to make sure in the proof that uh, the true parameter lies in the confidence sets. Yeah, yeah, right. Because uh, the strong value of alpha then. Yeah, because we can run the algorithm for multiple times, and we will get multiple policies, and then we can test every policy and see which right. one is better. And and also maybe, uh, well, if you have some epsilon, then you can set like your target accuracy or whatnot then you can set a lower limit on alpha based on that, I guess, right? Like if alpha is smaller than a certain value or this minimum singular value is smaller than a certain value, you wouldn't be able to guarantee any, any, anything anyways. Uh, so there is a lower limit of how small you can, uh, uh, sm how small a value you can deal with. Uh yeah i think so if we your bond, want is, your bond is going to depend on this minimum singular value as well i i assume uh, uh, it, it, uh, so, yeah. so actually it doesn't depend on it oh no uh, wait, wait a minute. oh it depends on it sorry, sorry. it depends on it because then yeah. Uh, yeah yeah like it will take more time for the confidence test to shrink if this minimum singular value is closer to zero should mm -hmm. be and then the algorithm needs to collect more samples uh, to distinguish good policies from bad policies. I forgot it. I, yeah, I thought it doesn't depend on the. Really? It doesn't, okay. it doesn't depend on it. Yeah. I thought it does. I need to check the paper. I, I forgot it. <laughs> so. Okay, that would be curious. Uh, it, uh, well, the theorem statement says that uh, the sample complexity, the number of iteration depends inversely on alpha. So yeah. I expect that if if you if you make everything adaptive, then it will be the minimum singular value that shows up in place of one over alpha in that bound. And maybe there is a log price for that, log one over minimum singular value. That's for the binary search or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, we need somehow, yeah, yeah you're right. We somehow we need to pay it here maybe. I think we need to pay it here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. I think that probably every algorithm needs to pay, uh, which leads to uh, um, another question, like, did, did you make an attempt to get some lower bonds that are showing whether the constants that appear in the bond are of the right order or something? Oh, so you mean the device. Device. Yeah. depending on this alpha? Yeah, for example, the one over alpha. Yeah, um, currently yeah, we, we don't have that lower bound. And I guess like your bound is going to depend on the horizon as well in some way and number of states and actions, number of observations. Yeah, yeah. And right. then, I think, I think it, before talking about lower bound, I feel like maybe the first thing we should do is like uh, getting a tighter upper bound. I think currently we have some S to the A, A to or something, right? Right, Chinghua? Right. Or O to the A, something like that, okay. which is clearly I think maybe it's clearly not optimal in that sense. Yeah. Well, either tightening the upper bond or coming up with lower bonds. And sometimes the lower bond can really ignite good research and tighten the upper bonds, right? Agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if there is a huge gap, then like everyone's like, wow, okay. We have to close that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, so I also want to, so I guess I understand this this condition now uh, about the palm DPs. Uh, yeah, so because like, I was like, how come that optimism is going to work with palm DPs? That, that needs like really special class. 
So you can have this very simple examples where you have two actions. One action brings you know information, you know, partial monitoring. Mm -hmm. The other action gives you like good information. And then if you're optimistic, then you will keep choosing the action that gives you no information because well, it's so great. Like it could be very good. Like there is no information. Uh, <laughs> So yeah. maybe maybe it's very good. Like you can set up these these problems in such a way that an action that uh, brings you no information can look really good under some parameter settings, and then the optimistic algorithms are going to fall into the trap of always just trying those. Uh, so this is a very silly uh, special case of palm DPS. Uh, so that kind of shows that. Well, you really have to do something as an optimism um, if you want to extend the algorithm beyond uh, the, the class of palm DPs that you're considering now, right? And it doesn't necessarily need to be, uh, so maybe there is some other subclass of uh, palm DPs uh, where the exponential lower bound that you're presenting doesn't apply, right? Like if we can dissect mm -hmm space of palm DPs in many different ways yeah, yeah. Uh, where uh, maybe you need to take uh, these actions that uh, are potentially costly, so optimistic algorithms are not going to like them, but they bring you a lot of information. Mm -hmm. uh, so have you, have you had a chance to think about this? Uh, yeah, so um, actually uh, we are thinking about some same uh, yeah, we are thinking about something slightly different. So we are considering, currently we are working on the case of oral complete study. <laughs> oh. yeah, so, so I think that has some, yeah, that, that has some connection with, with your question. So in that setting, um, we will no longer have these good properties uh, in any complete prime DP because here actually we are looking at some three consecutive local steps. So, so so looking, by looking at all those three consecutive steps, we can determine the entire dynamics of a whole trajectory. So that's something very good. But in, in the own complete case, uh, somehow we need to uh, look at more than three steps. Um, and we need to look at uh, some subsequence of length that is long enough to give us, the, to give us enough information about the hidden state. Yeah, I think, and I think it's also, yeah, it's also possible um, to obtain some further stronger results. Uh, yeah, if you make some further, I mean, assumption about the structure of this prime DP. For example, it, for example, I think in some work, they, they assume uh, each observation can be, I mean, they, they assume different, observe, different hidden states cannot observe this, cannot emit the same observation. So it's like, it's called the rich observation setting, I think. Yeah. So in that setting, I think they, they can obtain some like oracle efficient results. Yeah. All right, so I also saw that there was some intense discussion in the chat. I don't know if anybody would like to volunteer to summarize what was going on in there. Uh, or maybe if uh, maybe if uh, Jack feels that his question was not answered, you can ask it publicly. Uh, okay. Uh, and... So Jack Zhang, are you here? Maybe yeah, maybe. Uh, but but I see that. Okay, maybe he's here. Oh yeah, so uh, I think you guys have already uh, answered my question. So my, my main concern was um, because we're we're studying under complete MDP, and uh, the lower bound seems to su suggest that anything outside of this regime, uh, so anything that's that's over complete or are, are not solvable with a uh, small sample complexity. Uh, I, I I see I. I well, I, I would say a little, little bit different about uh, this lower bounds. I think lower bound is more or less to justify our assumption instead of saying like uh, without our assumption, nothing can do. For example, even with uh, 
under uh, for over company setting, what we are saying is for over company setting without additional assumptions, we cannot do this problem. But it's possible for some subclass of yep. over company poor MVP and under some assumptions about the this opposite emission matrix or some other stuff, and uh, maybe we can still have some positive results. So it's still yeah, possible. yeah. I realized that point too. Yeah, you just you just you're just basically saying you need some additional structure going into the over complete regime. Right. Yeah, great, great. So, OK, so finally, I, I want to spend one or two minutes uh, introducing our recent new work, <laughs> OK, for reinforcement learning with function approximation. So this is some work I'm, yeah, I'm really excited about. So, so it's, its name is Bellman Eruder Dimension New Rich Classes of Reinforcement Learning Problems and Sample Efficient Algorithm. So this is a joint work with Chi and Sobhan. So in this work, uh, we, we propose a new complexity measure for, for the function approximation setting um, that is more general than the existing Bellman rank and Eruda dimension. And so as you can see in this figure, uh, it subsumes uh, many known results uh, as, as, some, as, a spe as special cases, like the, um, the linear MDP on the the low Bellman rank settings, all the low Bellman rank settings, and all the low Eruda dimension settings. And we also provide um, an algorithm, an algorithm uh, named GORF. And the core idea is also based on, I mean, local confidence set plus global optimism. And we prove this, the sample capacity of this, uh, of this new algorithm matches uh, many of the state of art existing results uh, for example, uh, in the linear function approximation setting, uh, in the Bellman rank setting, and, and it improves the existing bounds for low eluder dimension setting. And finally, uh, we provide uh, a new, new analysis of an existing algorithm called Olive. Uh, this, uh, this algorithm uh, was originally proposed by Jiang, yeah, by Jiang et al. Uh, for solving low Bellman rank problems. And we give it a new analysis um, by using the definition of B dimension. And the proof is, yeah, so from my view, the proof is surprisingly simple and fo follows almost directly from the definition of B dimension. So, so it's some, so I want to, yeah, if you guys are interested in this work, uh, you can take a look. It's an archive now. Yeah. Or you can also ask me questions here. Well, I'm sure that this can act as a teaser for an upcoming talk uh, at some unspecified date, but uh, this looks like a very relevant paper for this audience, for sure. Yeah, yeah, right. Thanks for the heads up. I guess everybody can go and download it from archive right now. Yeah, if you have questions about the point, um, point uh, about the point we talk about, we can go back and check. Yeah. Out. So how about I, I stop recording now and then uh, mm -hmm. we can we can go to the uh, off the record phase. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>